The following program, The Lightning Strike, is sponsored by Mohammed Fahim and to the extent applicable their guests. The views and opinions expressed therein do not necessarily reflect those of Newsweb Radio Company or its management. Get ready to be jolted out of the ordinary and into a world where conversations are charged with intensity and facts. The Lightning Strike Talk Radio with your host, Mohammed Fahim, broadcasting live from the heart of the city on Chicago's Progressive Talk Radio, WCPT 820 AM. Welcome to a radio show that charges through the airwaves with an electricity like no other. Here's your host, Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and uh, good rainy morning. We've got so many things happening in the country today, folks. With me in the studios again with uh, my co-host, uh, Ken DeLuke. Howdy, folks. And Congresswoman Marie Newman. Uh, good welcome morning. Welcome both. And, uh, folks, the number to call in if you want to join the conversation, 773-763-WCPT or 763-9278. Of course... We are not going to ignore what's on the top of mind for everyone in the country right now is the assassination attempt on President, uh, former President uh, Donald Trump. And the FBI has identified the shooter as a 20-year-old registered Republican, Thomas Matthew Crooks. So at this point, it is an ongoing investigation. That's all we know for sure. And at WCPT, we always say that facts matter. So till we have more information on this, till we know for sure what is happening, and there is some information that is verified, we are not going to be talking much about it. We all know, and you are watching the news on all the channels, that there was an attempt made a registered Republican, 20-year-old kid, shot at the president, the former president. And the, the former president has survived the assassination attempt. And there was a little nick on his right ear. That's what we, uh, what we saw in the pictures. So, Murray, how important is it when you as a public servant are going out there? How important is security and what happened? Where's the lapse over here? Because there was a guy who was interviewed uh, by BBC. He said that he had informed uh, some of the security personnel that he saw this guy, uh, you know, bear crawling on top of a rooftop. And this was like five minutes before the shots rang out and they paid no attention to him. You know, it is uh, always a difficult thing um, when you're doing the uh, Monday morning quarterbacking after a a postmortem like that. So at the end of the day, um, typically how it works at a public event like that is that um, Secret Service and FBI are in charge of the what they would say the inner perimeter is. And then the outer perimeter is handled by uh, local public law enforcement. And so. There could have been a communication issue. There could have been a bunch of things. I don't think it was a shortage of personnel because they added extra in Mm -hmm. um, before the event happened. It was reported and verified. So don't know. Now, to be clear, let's not blame any of our uh, law enforcement at any levels because it could have been um, something that was really extraordinary. We just don't know yet. Further, I will say about that, that county is very Trump friendly. And so Mm -hmm. maybe they were... They felt like, oh, gosh, this is a a safer event. Um, It could have been that, um, you know, and it is a uh, gun friendly county, as the district PA indicated. And so maybe, you know, maybe there was less concern for a a bunch of reasons. We don't know yet. And to your point at the outset is that we were, um, you know, we just don't know anything. I I think that the main question is, what was his motivation? Is he is there a mental illness involved in here? And uh, I would also like, as you mentioned, about gun um, the follow-up question, um, did he obtain his AR-15 legally? Uh, I mean, Well, what- uh, that's where I'm saying, uh, Ken, we don't know at this point. We don't have any uh, more information. So as the information develops, uh, we'll definitely talk about it. Maybe next week uh, we'll know more as to what's happened. But uh, today we wanted to focus on what's happening with the Democrats and the Democratic Party and uh, President Biden continuing to misstep. And is it time to bring in the vice president is there for a reason not just to look uh, good at uh, you know ribbon cuttings right so we have a vice president who has been vetted who has gone through the process for the last three three and a half years now whatever and uh, ready to step in 
What are the Democrats going to do about it? That's what we want to focus on today, folks. We're also going to talk about Project 2025. Let's not forget it in all of these things that are happening. We still have a country that we are going to inherit. And if Project 2025 comes in, kicks in, if Trump gets elected, forget about it. There's not going to be a country that we want to live in anymore. Uh, we're going to focus on two things in the Project 2025 today. Uh, the personnel and staffing that they have planned and the control of the Justice Department, which will basically be answerable to no one but the president. So forget about, uh, you know, having the three equal branches of government. There's not going to be. And we uh, also want to talk about uh, Netanyahu's address to Congress, which has been rescheduled. So plenty of things to talk and uh, share with you. If you want to join the conversation the number to call in is 773-763-9278. I also wanted to bring out uh, the uh, the massacre again yesterday in, in Gaza. 90 people killed. Yeah. Marie, what is happening? Man, yeah. come on. This, this is unreal. So you talk about uh, Biden not being in his senses. He could have stopped it a long time back, but I think he is being pulled in too many directions mm -hmm. to really, really know what is good. Uh, for humanity at large. So uh, let's start off with uh, plan B. Is it time for Kamala to step in? You know, good question. I don't think it's for any of us on this dais to say, nor is it. Uh, and what I will say in looking at all the polling, so there, there's a couple of facts about the aggregated and the median polling is that mm -hmm. um, a uh, Kamala Harris right now, VP Harris, is polling at the same rate or higher than um than Mr. Biden in all instances. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the answer. Um, he has picked up a little bit in the last several days, I will say, too, in um, several polls in Ipsos, ABC, and um, a few others. And so, you know, I don't think there's a really clear answer. And by the way, we're not going to have a clear answer from the data. It should be a data-driven decision. Mm -hmm. But polls can be interpreted a bunch of different ways. I will share one analogy, and I'm not advocating for President Biden to, to not move forward or to move forward or for VP Harris to move forward or not move forward. What I will tell you from a pure polling perspective is that if you look in the cross tabs, tabs there's one thing that's true. The six swing states are not looking good right now uh, for President Biden. That doesn't mean he can't improve them. He can. Um, she does better in the uh, swing states. So the cross tabs are important. The other thing that I will say is important is that um, President Biden has been campaigning for nine months and he's at a deadlock with Trump for all intents and purposes, some down mm -hmm. six points. But Kamala is coming out dead even with him on if this was day one of her campaign. So if I'm looking at it strictly from a perspective of who ca who has a lot of room to grow, it probably is VP Harris. But on the other hand, people he is beloved. The president is beloved. He could stay in place and we, he could win. It, it is. I don't think anyone can know right now. Ken. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, the Democrats have this nasty habit of shooting themselves in the foot, and they may be uh, getting what a self-fulfilling prophecy is all about. You need to back up. Right now, the way it stands, Biden said he's staying in. We need to stop the rhetoric and, and ask these questions. Sure. Is he older? Absolutely he's older. Does he have his common sense? Did you see him talk about foreign policy uh, when he had the interview the other day and, and like some of the details and the nuances that that he was bringing up he definitely has his act together now he may slip up time to time on a word or two or a name or two I've done that okay I get it but he has some really talented people who are behind him great advisors very people who are way more intelligent than I am and he is very much capable of making decisions so we need as long as he's still in the race and he says he's in the race to put full support behind him and really point out the compared to what Okay, do you want a guy who, like, literally lies all the time? Do you want someone who didn't even know what NATO was, but he realized what it was in three minutes? I mean, seriously, that's the comparison we're talking about here. We need to back who is on the ticket right now until he decides that there's a reason he can't do it. And then I'm all for backing the alternatives. Well, uh, one other thing that I want people to understand is that the difference between a democratic controlled administration and a republican controlled administration 
night and day. I want to give an example of what is happening in Houston as we speak. Republican-controlled state, category one hurricane, not even a three or a four, category one. The entire city has been knocked off its feet. Great. It's been over one week now. Center Point Energy is the company that is responsible for maintaining the electrical grid in Houston. Well, let me interject real quick, just to give some perspective. The whole country, there's a West Coast grid and an East Coast grid. There's only one state in the whole union that has their own grid, and that's Texas. They are separate from everyone else. So if there weren't a problem, say in Illinois, we would make up and get power from adjoining states. Texas doesn't have that opportunity. Well, uh, I I do have uh, connections still in Texas. I haven't lived there for so long, and I'm getting messages like crazy from family and friends over there, uh, business associates, that they are going to Rice University because it has power and they are using uh, the, the electrical thing over there to charge their phones in order to communicate. And the heat has set up, the, the heat is like crazy yeah. over there now. No power for seven days in most of the areas of Houston and they have not even cleaned out the trees that have fallen on the streets. Now, people from other uh, states have come in to help, the uh, other electrical companies, and most, most of them are going back now because they, they can't do anything, okay? So you, you want a, a Republican administration, uh, people? Just think about it. This is a preview of what you could expect if the Republicans come in, especially with their Project 2025, to replace all the bureaucrats that are out there, the people with experience, with inexperienced people who have vowed loyalty to the Fuhrer, and uh, they want to bring them in to run the country. Just think about it, folks. Okay, leave, leave politics aside, leave personalities aside, leave assassination attempts aside, leave a president making a couple of mistakes in a debate aside, Look at what happens when you have a Republican administration. And this is a perfect example of how the country will go to the dogs when we, when we allow something like that to happen. Okay, so uh, again, uh, folks, we are not going to talk about uh, the Trump assassination attempt today because we don't want to get into any kind of speculation at this point. And uh, on WCPT, we are always proud of the, of, the, of the fact that facts matter. At this point, we don't have too many facts. So please, if you want to call in, let's not talk about the assassination attempt till we have more facts. And maybe we can cover that next week when we have more information coming out. Uh, Ron, I know that you want to uh, jump in on this. But at this point, we are not going to be talking about the assassination attempt. You're more than welcome to talk about any other topic. Uh, We know the attempt was made. We know the guy who made it was a registered Republican, 20-year-old kid. We don't know anything more apart from that. And I really don't want to get into speculation on on that topic today. So with due apologies to our listeners, let's wait. Let's see what facts come out, and then we can cover that. But what we want to talk about today, today again is what is going to happen if... Biden tomorrow decides that, okay, I am going to gracefully retire. And if the vice president comes in to replace him as a candidate, what are the other possibilities of who would she bring in as her teammate? Any any scuttlebutt that you are hearing, Marie? Yeah, I think that, well, we do know one thing that's factual is that they are testing uh Uh, Vice President Harris is polling um, more aggressively and head to head against Trump. And I think that they're in there. There's some internal polling that's looking at various uh, VP picks she may have. I think their criteria, from what I'm understanding, if in fact that happens and it's not happening, to be clear, is that they were to go down that path, they'd look at a set of criteria. Um, how how do they balance her out, right? Should it be um, someone male? Should it be someone from a southern state? Should it be someone from um, a southwestern state? They'd look at someone to balance um, out 
her strong set of criteria, which is, um, you know, incredibly uh, talented prosecutor, has worked at the local level, the state level, was a senator, and now has had the job of VP for three mm-hmm. and a half years and was the practicing president, you know, right? Mm-hmm. So um, who would we put that you naturally look at governors? So you would look at a Josh Shapiro, Andy Brashear from Kentucky, Southern State. Um, you may look at uh, J.B. Pritzker, Gavin Newsom, Gretchen. Uh, um, Vidma. Yeah, thank you from uh, Michigan. Yeah. I always want to call her Whit- Wetmer instead of Whitmer. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so Governor Whitmer um, and um, and several others. Those are all good ways to look at it. But there's no way of knowing, and it's highly pr- premature. I could think of a um, a great uh, can- a person for that job, a uh, ex uh, congresswoman from Illinois, uh, <laughs> who just happens to be sitting at this table. Absolutely would be, not. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, don't well, have the experience and don't want it. Exactly. Okay. So we got uh, Dave calling in from Hoffman Estates to talk about uh, Biden stepping down or not stepping down, stepping up, uh, at least keeping his feet grounded. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dave, good morning. You are on the lightning strike with Mohammed, Marie, and Ken. Oh, by the way, by the way, folks, uh, by the way, by the way, hold on. John Arena is not in the studio today. So I just wanted you guys to know that John is somewhere out uh, on the on the ocean or where there's no phone connection at this point. So John will be joining us when he comes back to land. Go ahead, Dave. Okay. Uh, I was just talking. I mentioned with Paul, the scenery tonight. I had heard something earlier in the week where uh, the Democrats were going to try to get in the president to step down. The clock's ticking now because on August 6th or August 7th, they said <coughs> Ohio would have the name on the ballot. You know, if they, you know, if they don't pull his name, you know, if he doesn't step down and they get him to step down, that his name will be on the ballot in Ohio. So I don't know if you guys have heard any clarification. Cause yeah, that, that's right, Dave, but that's that. almost a month away. And if he, if he um, like the last couple interviews and, and uh, appearances he's made, if he uh, shows the strength that he has then, I mean, sure, there's a few flubs here and there, but he's been pretty much on point. If he continues in that trend, I don't think he's going to be stepping down. But if uh, there's uh, some cognitive inevitability that has to be addressed, then we'll be able to do that well before. Ken, I, I, I uh, think a... A lot of it, guys, has to do with not so much the age factor because Bernie Sanders is older than yeah. than Biden, and Bernie is as sharp as a tack even at that age. Okay, uh, there must be, you know, there was a news item about a neurologist visiting the the White House a few times. Uh, so, if you have a health condition. Face up to it. Okay, hold on. Let me just, I'm going to step in right there. Okay. The neurologist that's been there is because they are doing some, uh, they're looking to do some legislative work as it relates to Alzheimer's and, and uh, Parkinson's disease, okay? He was there, and most of the times that he was visiting the White House, Biden wasn't even there. So it's not that he was seeing Biden because of a particular health issue that Biden had. It was something that was more an administrative tax to uh, get their ducks in a row for new legislation. And that particular neurologist um, services um, senior military as well, just to be clear. Okay. Yeah. So, so what my yeah. point is that if you have a, like, I would, I would not imagine referring to Donald Trump as his vice president. You know, that, that's, I, that's a big flub, I, man. I Come on. You. Like, so, okay. I'll tell you what. And then uh, yeah, re- referring I, I, to Zelensky as yeah. Putin. Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, but if you look back at the, this man's career, and he's a wonderful man. Oh, absolutely. Like, right. Like, done a great job. He has flubbed and had gaffes like that for 45 years, quite literally. So this is not new behavior. Um, I'm with you. If there's a health condition, like, let's get it out there and let's talk about it. Let's all be honest. It's just like anything, right? Um, But he's been flubbing and gaffing for literally 45 years, as have I and all of us, right? You know, I... I will tell you, it's easy to do when you have a lot of facts running around your head. I've done it in at events, so you know. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you are the only person who can see, who can feel whether you're up to something or not. True. Okay. Uh, like for me, for example, I mean, I wanted to run for office. I tried a couple of times. People are still coming up to me and saying, "Hey, you should run for office." I'm like, "No, I'm not going to run for office anymore." I've recently had some health issues. Okay, I've had some heart, uh, you know, issues, cardiology issues going on with my with my health. I'm going to prioritize that. Yeah. 
running for office is not so important for me at this point in my life. Okay, so yeah, sometimes you have to to understand uh, where you are coming from and not let others push you into it. My feeling is that Biden is being pushed into taking that stand, even though uh, he doesn't look he doesn't look good. Yeah, he doesn't look healthy. So, on that note, folks, uh, please uh, keep uh, keep it in mind that no matter what, it is not one person. It is a whole administration, and it is the philosophy of the administration. It is the philosophy of the Democratic Party that will keep this country going in the right direction. And if we don't understand that, just think about what is going to happen. The most important thing, uh, Dave, that I want you to share with your family and your friends is it is not just going to be four years of Trump. It is going to be 30 years of the Supreme Court totally, totally loaded with Trump's people, and that is going to uh, impact our generations to come as to what policy the country is going to be following. So that is something that we have to be totally, totally aware of. It is not the four-year gig. It is going to be way beyond four years if we make the mistake of electing Donald Trump as our next president. Dave, thank you so much uh, for calling in. Thank you for listening. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back on the other side of the break with more conversations. I'm Mohammed Fahim with the lightning strike with me in the studios, Ken DeLuc and Marie Newman. John Arena has taken the day off today. Are you a business looking for the right talent or a job seeker searching for your dream career? Look no further than the Center for Strategic Solutions, your workforce solution experts. Our experienced team at the Center for Strategic Solutions is dedicated to connecting employers with top-tier talent and helping job seekers find opportunities that truly align with their goals. We're more than just consultants. We're your partners in success. Ready to take your workforce to the next level or land that ideal job? Contact the Center for Strategic Solutions today at 1-847-306-9274 or visit us online at www.cfssus.com. The Center for Strategic Solutions, your bridge to a brighter future in the Windy City. The number to call is 847-306-9274 or send an email to info at cfssus.com. That is info at cfssus.com. Welcome back to the Lightning Strike with Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, folks. Welcome back here to the Lightning Strike. I'm Mohammed Fahim. And with me in the studios today, Kendall Luke, uh, Murray Newman, and uh, of course, uh, Dylan handling the boats for us as usual, doing a great job looking through his phone. Most of the time, he's just jiving over here. So, what we wanted to talk about again is continuing our conversation about Project 2025 the kind of impact that it is going to have on our lives and on the lives of our children and grandchildren if we allow this to happen. Today we're going to look at two things. The ideas that they have spouted for personnel and staffing and the Justice Department. Ken, take it away. Okay, uh, I have to say I'm, I'm, I, I feel much more in a positive uh, mode right now because what 2025 does is, is showing a dystopian uh, agenda for very hard right conservative uh, concepts if Trump gets reelected. And with what's just happening in the world recently between um, um, Great Britain, uh, you know, not going with the the far right, uh, they uh, rallied and, and, and voted. France and France, which was amazing. They thought for sure that was a done deal, and they came in third, which is like you know it makes me very optimistic. If people understand what this twenty twenty five project is, and I've been seeing a lot more um, in the media about this, which is important. Um, now uh, Trump has been trying to deny that he has anything to do with this, but this is basically uh, a companion to his uh, campaign's analog initiative called Agenda 47, and it's basically taking those talking points and put it on steroids, and all of the people who are behind this 2025 um, 
project are his officials and advisors. They're the main people who have been part of his administration in the past and who are advising him right now. So for him to say he doesn't know anything about it makes about as much sense as for him saying he's never heard of NATO before. Well, uh, what do you expect from Trump? Okay, with all due respect to him being shot and all of that, yeah, he's going to get well. It's just a little nick on the ear. But the guy has been consistently lying since the day that he was born. Okay, I'm pretty sure that when he... When he was born, he looked at it and said, hey, why did you come in here? Uh, I didn't come in here. I wasn't born. I was forced to come into this world. The guy is a confirmed liar, folks. And we have to understand. He said, oh, I've never heard of Project 2025. Would anybody believe it? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. So, anyways, one of the we've been doing this compared to what segment last uh, week we spoke of the uh, LBGPQ um, issues that they uh, they were addressing in it. This week we're going to be talking about their plans for personnel and staffing, and then after that we'll be talking about their ideas for the Justice Department. So, as it goes to personnel and staffing, the plan right now aims to reinstate Schedule F. That's a Trump-era executive order that makes federal employees fireable at will, literally stripping tens of thousands of employees from their civil service protection. So whether you had a job for 40 years and you're really, really good at it and you happen not to agree 100% with the uh, the right side of the aisle, you basically stand to lose your job. Okay, so that's one of the main problems there. Um, it, it, it concentrates the executive branch to have you know greater authority for just magna loyalists. It's kind of crazy. Now, they also have created a training academy for potential employees for the next administration, which uh, provides aspiring employees with the insight, the background knowledge, and <laughs> the expertise in governance to immediately begin rolling back the, quote, destructive policy and advancing the conservative ideals in the federal government. Okay, so that's primarily they just want to take over from, you know, the the... The meat and potatoes of how everything works, you know, t- to that level. Um, Marie, uh, does that sound like a good plan to you? <laughs> well, I, I wanted to. I wanted to really jump in here real quick. Uh, you know, when the COVID thing was happening, a lot of the federal employees and a lot of the people were either laid off or you know were working from For home. Yeah. And when you wanted to renew your passport. After COVID ended, it was taking six months to bring in new people on board, bring them up to speed on how to do things. Uh, The unemployment department over here, IDES, got totally backlogged like crazy. They They made a $12 million deal with one of the suppliers or whatever IT people to come up with a program to process these applications for unemployment claims. Everything went to hell in a handbasket. So you're going to replace 50,000 federal employees with loyalists and and train them to do things? It's it's a bit untenable, and it demonstrates their lack of actually business, nonprofit, and organizational knowledge because that is not an attainable management plan. Just mm-hmm. start. Let's start there. Right? Yep. Not tenable if you're an executive. Any of us that have, uh, you know, managed hundreds, thousands of people, that, that, just from a organizational standpoint, a silly idea. However, um, it, what is a good idea is to have a training academy, mm-hmm. but it has to be um, impartial and bipartisan. So, yeah. you know, it's not bad to have a training academy, but it's really bad to have it indoctrinated in things like religion and other um, Christian nationalist ideas. Let me just share a, an important fact. Um, we have verified that uh, Bush Sr., Bush Jr., Clinton, and Obama all thanked the preceding uh, operation um, at, at the White House and in all branches of government, the institutional knowledge. So whether uh, the last several Republicans and Democrat, uh, Democratic presidents have all said thank you to the former staff of the separate party, of the alternate party, that being the Republicans and, or the mm-hmm. Democrats in, in the case of Obama and Clinton, 
Thank you so much for the institutional knowledge. So that is a good thing. Institutional knowledge is a really powerful thing and is why those problems happened. Um, you know, we had lack of institutional knowledge because the Trump administration uh, just kept cutting people um, even before. We didn't even have a pandemic group. That mm -hmm. said, um, with regard to personnel, the alternate to that, um, to the point of compared to what, <laughs> the Biden administration has been very good about um, getting folks on board, getting them trained and getting them into places. So we solved the passport problem over time. It was painful, mm -hmm. but we got there. Yeah. Right. Same with the IRS. Right. Where the tax uh, returns and analysis was way behind. We got people on board and now things are better. Um, so that goes to show when you hire properly and you have a process, it goes well. Um, f what I will say finally on that personnel topic is is that what is very problematic in addition to, um, and by the way, there's no fealty or loyalty test. So in the Project 2025 personnel um, tenet that they espouse in uh, this doc Heritage Foundation document is that you take a test for fealty and loyalty. Oh, in you have words, to take an oath. Yeah. Yeah. And so so that would never fly in a Biden administration or a Democratic administration. And then further, finally, and probably even more importantly, they believe in a unitary executive theory for personnel in which the pres everybody reports to the president. There's very little hierarchy and um, it would be chaotic and they all have to be loyal to him. So and he can make any decision he wants. So, again, back to the at will, he can fire you because you didn't look at him in the hallway. You know, it doesn't matter. So um, just flawed from a basic organizational tenant perspective, but very flawed because it could lead to a Christian nationalist uh, type of environment at all branches of government. Okay, okay folks. Marie, I spreche ein bisschen Deutsch circa 1933. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. Okay. So uh, uh, Ron uh, calling back in uh, from Michigan, wanting to talk about the Texas energy situation. Ron, uh, we would love to uh, talk about that. Like I said, that is something that is factual. We are seeing it. Seven days, no power in most of Houston. Ron, you're up. What's up? Hello, Mohammed and uh, Maria, and I forget the gentleman's name. Ken. 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 That's next spelled backwards. Ken. 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 Remember Ken and Barbie. You're never going to forget it, okay? <laughs> I was playing with G.I. Joe. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway uh, uh, you're talking about Paxton and the Texas power situation, okay? You know, our power got knocked out about 3 o'clock this morning. It sounded like a bomb from Russia, but it came back on at 7 in the morning, okay? We, uh -huh. but in Texas... Governor Abbott has been on vacation in Asia, and he could have uh, called for federal uh, emergency aid from Joe Biden, President Joe, but he refused to do that. And now he comes home and he complains that the federal government is not giving power to the people who are still knocked out from the power in Texas because of his administration. And But I understand most of the power that is out is in minority areas. So Texas and, uh, uh, and Abbott are happy to have that power, uh, you know, hurt those people. So, you know, you hear that in the news media. I didn't, I didn't hear your full report, Mom. Like, I'm not blaming you. But they, they say, oh, Texas has still got no power. But they don't say because Abbott will not allow it to happen because he's vacationing in Asia. You so, go, f go, f go figure that out, man. And uh, if, if the Republican administration comes in, you know, Trump would be on Mar-a-Lago playing golf. When the country will I didn't be. I want to mention that name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to mention that name. Okay. Uh, Ron, thank you so much for listening in. Thank you and so much. Uh, we will jump in into the next topic on this Project 2025 is about uh, the judiciary and uh, what these bozos want to do to our judicial system when, if, when, and if they come into power. Uh, okay. Ken. Well, the Department of Justice and the federal law enforcement um, structure, in the eyes of the pro Trump. Republicans and their right wing media allies, the Department of Justice and the FBI have long been corrupted by left wing ideology and bureaucratic deep state. Now, Project 2025 seeks to radically reshape federal law enforcement for the benefit of conservative strongmen. Basically, and this is a lot of stuff, and I'm not saying everything that's in this either because I don't have time, but Project 2025 claims that the DOJ has been a bloated bureaucracy with a critical core of personnel who are infatuated with the perpetuation of radical liberal agenda ideas and the defeat of their perceived political enemies. They also cite that the FBI's handling of the Russia hoax of 2016, big tech collusion, suppression of Hyder Biden, 
Hunter Biden's laptop. Oh, my God, I never want to hear that sentence again. Um, you know, uh, Project 2025 calls for future GOP administrators to immediately review all major FBI investigations and turn, terminate any that are unlawful or contrary to the national interest, which they will describe. They also suggest eliminating the FBI director's 10-year term limit established by Congress, claiming the position must remain politically accountable to the president in the same manner as the head of any other federal department or agency. So as far as accountability goes, well, guys, that's kind of out the window if that happens. Um, they want to call for initiating legal action against progressive prosecutors, citing local government officials who supposedly deny American citizens the equal protection of laws by refusing to prosecute criminal offenses in their jurisdictions. And we're talking, they'll be talking about like LBCTQ rights, they'll be talking a number of things that if you don't prosecute, then you yourself could be liable for that. Uh, they claim that the um, they have ensh enshrined a firm of action discrimination in all aspects of its operations under the guise of equality and vows to reserve, reverse that trend. So, um, you know, to give minorities a leg up to, uh, you know, really help people who don't have uh, the opportunities because of discrimination, basically we're talking about white discrimination now and they're going to overturn it to make that a policy. Okay, um, they want to reassign election-related offenses to the criminal division of the DOJ rather than the civil rights division, claiming that voter registration fraud and unlawful ballot correction will be made federal election offenses that are never appropriately investigated and prosecuted. Okay. You like a new GOJ? <laughs> How does that work for you? Well, again, let's start at the most fundamental problem in, in this Project 2025, Trump's Trump's doctrine. And I just want to add that um, Trump did endorse this on tape um, in 2022. So he endorsed this um, when it was in a very similar mode that it is right now and continued to endorse it. So it is Trump's 2025. Let's be clear. Um, so um, just as a, by comparison, so the most fundamental problem is, again, um, in this document, they're identifying the unitary executive theory. So um, the DOJ would now report to um, and the Supreme Court would report, literally report hierarchically um, to um, uh, the, the president. To the president. Yeah. yeah. Very wrong. So there would be no separation of the three branches. Very wrong problematic. Um, but just by comparison, let's look at the numbers uh, between Biden and Trump. So Biden has um, nominated um, 43 judges um, at uh, and one associate um, Supreme Court uh, justice, 156 judges at the uh, district court level, um, and many others. In that group, and important to note that um, 127 of the 200 judges confirmed to the bench are women, 58 are black and 36 are Hispanic. Um, so this has been and 35 are uh, Asian American or native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. So very diverse and what it should be. A, a, a judicial bench should reflect society, right? It should be a reflection. I've said this in every um, executive position I've ever held. That, um, you have to be reflective of um, the uh, geography in, with, in which you live. Um, so this is very demonstrative of that. Conversely, Trump is primarily white, has only um, appointed a fraction of the um, the judges. But what he did do that was very impactful and now very frightening is that he um, was able to, it, to um, appoint two Supreme Court judge justices and 51 appellate court judges. Mm -hmm. So that has helped him in all of his recent legal activities, right? Um, not the least of which is they've established immunity for him, which is the biggest problem. So the contrast is night and day between um, a Democratic um, administration and a, a Trump administration or their 2025 plan. So, folks, uh, that is uh, it in a, in a nutshell. We will, we will be covering more of the Project 2025 every week uh, as we go towards the elections. It's a, it's a 900 and odd pages document. Now, just Imagine the Heritage Foundation bringing together about a hundred other groups and a lot of them are being paid big money to come up with these plans and they have got Trump's year. Uh, 
at this point, no, Trump's ear is hurting, so I don't want to get into... Uh, <laughs> too soon? <laughs> literally, it's too soon to talk about Trump's ear at this point. But uh, you know what I mean. Uh, our person of the week uh, this week is going to be a great person. His name is David Watt, and David is the owner of the Sage Plus Network in California. David will be joining us shortly, and hopefully Sheila White, our sec uh, segment producer, will also be jumping in to introduce David. If not, we'll just take the bull with the horns and run with David in a few minutes. Uh, but something that I wanted to really focus on again, folks, uh, I'm hearing a lot of scuttle, but now a lot of uh, complaints about Goodwill, Marie. The Goodwill Corporation, it seems that they have got quotas to raise X amount of dollars in every store. Yeah. And 99% uh, of the stuff there is donated. Right. They're jacking up prices like crazy. And a lot of people are complaining about it. Uh, by the way, uh, most people don't know that the Goodwill is uh, a nonprofit and uh, the CEOs typically earn about $500,000. Okay, so each Goodwill is independently operated as a non-profit. And uh, the CEO of the, of the company is making $500,000. That's the highest thing that I've seen for most non-profits. Yeah, worse than that. So um, just by comparison, is and, th and that is true. Most uh, non-profit CEOs make under $300,000 and they have, you know, a, a lot of responsibility, just like a for-profit. But mm -hmm. I'll give you one point of comparison. So uh, Wayne LaPierre, who was the um, the yeah. president of the CEO of the NRA, he started out at about hundred grand in 1990. And within three years, he was making five hundred grand. And most recently, went before he got ousted, was at a million. And that's just not how you roll with a nonprofit. That Absolutely. is horrifying. And uh, I have had uh, a lot of people personally reach out to me and complain that they have seen stuff at Goodwill that has actual stickers from TJ Maxx and other places like dollar ninety nine, and Goodwill has marked it up to two ninety nine and, and trying to. But, but what of all the good work they do? I mean, I'm sure they take all that money that they're making and they put it into some. Uh, Good programs, right? Well, we'll have to find out. We'll yeah. have to find out because they claim that uh, they use the money to train people with disabilities to find jobs. And uh, there uh, is that they do, and I can of course. attest to that. So, uh, you of know, course, I, I used to be the CEO of Little City, and they, yeah. there are partnerships with disability, whether it's a physical disability or a mental or emotional disability. Right. They do work with those. Parts. That but, said, though, there's some problems there. But I still uh, want to dig a little bit more into it and see what's happening. Uh, I would, I would rather, for my sake, I. Would would rather give a donation to Salvation Army than uh, spend my money on, on Goodwill. With that, uh, let's uh, go back to our phone lines and uh, our segment producer for our person of the week. Always great to have Sheila White joining us. Sheila, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in and reaching out to David Watt to bring him in as a person of the week. You want to take the ball and run with it, Sheila? Yes, good morning, everyone. I am really excited to have Mr. David Watt, who is the president of On Stage Plus, a network in Chicago. And um, there's so many things that are going on in our news today. And one of the things that um, I wanted to talk with David about is the minority um, stations and things like that, how they're producing and how they're getting the news out to a lot of people. David, welcome to the lightning strike. Hi, and thank you very much, Sheila. Good morning, David. Great. Hello. Thank you guys for having me. Okay. David, can you tell us a little bit about um, what's happening in the minority arena with uh, television and the networks that are out there? Well, I think the, the biggest thing out here that a lot of minority media companies are uh, suffering from, be it a print or, of course, uh, television or digital streaming such as we're in, is the fact that the undercapitalization, which, is, of course, is an old story, but um, there's a thing called the upfronts where a lot of the you know, advertisers and everything will go and kind of show potential advertising uh, companies or television uh companies, hey, this is what we have to spend, where's your market reach, what's your market segment, but they don't typically approach the um, black-owned and minority-owned companies. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we get what's called the scatter market, which is after they spend the majority of their money, they'll then say, okay, well, we got left over and kind of split it amongst the minority-owned companies. So 
that's a big issue. And of course, um, with what has just happened, one of the things that most of the companies could somewhat depend on was the political advertising when it's an election year. And of course, now um, Biden, uh, the Democratic Party, they pulled all their ads. And so the companies that were getting a piece of that market, that's dried up now too. So it's really tough just being able to get advertisers um, for in our reach. Well, David, I think uh, the ads have been pulled because of what happened yesterday. They want to probably recalibrate the ads and, uh, you know, uh, obviously they're not going to be uh, attacking as much uh, as they would have wanted to because the sympathy is with Trump at this point right now. So maybe that, that will clear up in a, in a week or so, in a couple of weeks, hopefully, especially for the you know smaller producers like you, right? Absolutely. That's what we're hoping, you know, but at the same time, it's not even, you know, once a year when it's an election year, that's like a four-year cycle, or even maybe it's local elections, but also just even regular advertisers. When typical small businesses look at advertising, they don't tend to look at the companies that aren't well-known. Now, in our market here, they might go for Fox, or they might go for something like that, where I'm like, we have a global reach. But, of course, they're like, hey, we've never heard of you. We've heard of Fox. We watch terrestrial TV. You know, so they tend to. So you've got to do a lot of, like, you know, client education just to try to get the business. I understand that. So, David, what is your background? How did you get into this field? <laughs> well, I started off many, many moons ago, I'll say, doing photography. Then, of course, being a... Um, in the entertainment industry, I did a lot of uh, background photography for motion pictures, and uh, as things progressed, I said, where's the wind blowing? Because I started seeing a lot of the people that I know that I'm competing against. So we started, my wife and I started uh, looking to see about streaming television and what was going to require our barrier to entry. You know, years ago, you needed millions of dollars to do something like this. Now, the barrier to entry is pretty low. We've probably invested probably over the last eight years, maybe 300000 and that might sound a bit high, but when you look at everything that you have to put into it, it's not really much. You don't have to do that up front. So we got into that, and uh, we just first were subscription-based, and then we said, okay, we want to do advertising because, you know, until you get enough subscribers, you got to be able to sustain yourself. So we do productions, mm-hmm. broadcasting, and all that. And like I said, my background, I went to uh, school and got a actually 2022 completed my doctorate in media studies so that i thought was going to bring me in more customers it hasn't (laughs) (laughs) you know uh david (laughs) uh, when i when i got my uh, i got a bachelor's in science with three majors and then i got a bachelor's in communications and journalism then i got a master's in communications and journalism then i got admitted into a phd program (laughs) and my dad said man you are killing yourself with degrees now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> go make a living. So he kicked me out of the house and said, go, go make a living. Enough, enough of these studies now. Okay. So I, I, I know where you're coming from. So. Okay. And uh, I want to share one thing, uh, one thing more with you guys. Uh, you know, I was... Uh, I was managing the state unemployment office, the uh, the work the worknet side of it, <laughs> as director of uh, business employer solutions in the Arlington Heights office, and uh, I was invited by one of these college, uh, this you know, degree mill colleges to come and address their uh, executive uh, MBA students. So I go, I show okay. up over there, and there's like like 15 people sitting, all middle aged, and I said, guys you would be much better off taking the money that you are paying here and starting a business oh. of your own. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, oh, my God. Uh, that college never invited me back to speak to the uh, students. Yeah. <laughs> But that was great life advice, absolutely. You know, I think we're taught to go through the system and to go to college and to get the higher degrees and you'll go up getting a good job and people will throw money at you, and that's not the case. Like, my son actually works for Amazon as an engineer. He has a degree in computer programming. He just graduated about two years ago, and I said, you know, what part of the, how much getting that job did the college help? He said, the, the degree got me the interview. He said, once I got in there, he told me, everything you learned forget about it we're going to train you in our process Absolutely. he said well, basically the degree got him the interview and i'm like that's a really 
expensive interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we need to we need to rethink uh, our education system. Uh, Sheila, yeah. thank you so much for bringing David on with us, and David, thank you so much for joining. We'll My see pleasure. if we can get together one of these days and um, you know have a cup of coffee. Uh, Ken wants to say something. Great. Yeah. Oh, by the way, David, um, you know, with my college experience, the thing that I learned the most is getting out of my little bubble growing up in the southwest side of Chicago and actually meeting people from all over the world that my way of interacting with people, I learned more from the social aspect of that than I ever learned on my educational side. So, I yeah, get it. our education system sucks. Let's just let's just be frank about it. OK, <laughs> it's a money making, money grabbing process. And yeah. yeah. Nobody comes out of it any more wiser than they went in, except for people with a heavy load of student loans that they have to repay. Uh, David, thank Absolutely. you so much for joining, man. Uh, you are local. Sheila is local. We are local. We'll, we'll get together and uh, chat more. Uh, this is not enough time on the radio for us. We are almost running short on time. Thank you so much for joining, David. And uh, thank Sheila, thank you so much for bringing in, David. Let's uh, wrap up the show today by okay. recapping what's happening uh, in our world now. I want to say on Facebook, we're on Facebook, by the way. You can see us live if you'd like to do that there is a gal oh, named great. patricia watson that just um typed in something which i thought was pretty relevant i want to uh, uh, read what she had to, to share with us okay she said the president stutters stuttering is overcome when stuttering compensates by overthinking and the brain re rewiring or pre-planning president joe, joe biden's brain is working just fine the democratic party would be stone foolish to continue to give the conservatives the ammunition to beat up on a man with wisdom and decades of experience and common sense international connections mastery of diplomacy we vote for the president as administrator president biden is old president biden's body moves slower he's an old white man who looks like an old white man tend to look so <laughs> okay. good point there i mean the stuttering does not make him uh, cognitively disabled hey. it means that his brain is working faster than his Ken. mouth when when I when we wanted to have a we wanted to have a photographer here today to take pictures in the studio, guys, and I was uh, discussing it in our team meeting. I said we are going to have a photographer, and Ken goes, "It's photographer." I'm like, "Come on, man, that's my accent." Okay, when we say if I want to look at your photos, do I have to say do I have to look at your photos? Come on, come, come on, Ken. Only for in France. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, folks, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we are here every Sunday morning from 9 to 10 to discuss what's happening in our world, what is happening with the rest of the country out there, how can we hold our elected officials accountable because we are paying their darn salaries, okay? They owe us. So we have to hold them accountable. On that note, uh, if you want to join us, please go to our website, you know, tlschicago.com for the lightning strike. Uh, Murray, let's uh, wrap up and uh, see what we have been discussing today. So we, we talked about, uh, obviously, the assassination attempt, and uh, we'll get into more of it uh, when we have more details, folks. Okay? Uh, we're not going to go into it uh, with half-based facts. We also talked about Project 2025 as to what is in store for us if and when we get into another Republican administration. It's not just, just going to be Trump. Any Republican who gets elected is going to be very much going into that kind of uh, you know, approach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are also going to bring out to you the misadministration, the missteps that happen in, in Texas, for example. Category 1 hurricane, not even a 3 or a 4. The entire city of Houston crashes. This happened, I believe, last year or the year before yeah, yeah, yeah. when they had uh, a cold snap. It's actually happened three times with Abbott when he's um, screwed up the grid. That grid is very precari precarious because it doesn't have any backup in Texas. They're a lone soldier out there. Uh -huh. And then on top of that, Governor Abbott has refused help not once, not twice, but three times. Well, there you go. So if there is an ego involved, and can you imagine someone like Trump coming in with his ego? Man, that's going to be a nightmare, folks. So please wake up. Wake your neighbors up. Wake your family up and say, enough 
is enough. We don't want to go in to support somebody who is a consistent liar, and that has been proven, and now a convicted liar. So it's not so much that we are against the Republicans, but they got to come up with a better candidate in order to lead the country forward in the future. We know that there's a two-party system. We are not going to be out of a two-party system. I don't think an independent has any chance of ever coming up in the next few years not at least. Not the way we're right? set up right now. I mean, it could happen. The, we could mirror some other um, democracies and have multiple parties. It might be a good idea. However, we're not there. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And hopefully in the, in the, you know, in the, in the fear of future, not near. See, here I'm stumbling. I'm stuttering. That doesn't <laughs> me, make me. We all do. That doesn't make do. me an incompetent Should person. Should we talk to your vice host? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, folks, uh, thank you all very much for listening, and please go to our website, tlschicago.com. Follow us on our YouTube channel, at TLS Chicago, over and out. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. The